Um, for those of you that don't recognize Mark as the, the guy who, I can't say took HubSpot public, but we were there from the early journey of HubSpot all the way through the IPO. Um, yeah. He's now, now the managing director at Stage 2 Capital, which is a first venture capital firm run and backed by the heads of sales and marketing. Uh, you're also a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, where he teaches a course on sales, marketing, and entrepreneurship. He's got tons of great content. He's got a book, The Sales Acceleration Formula, which was amazing, other than right in the middle, I think somebody put a big F you to outbound in there, but we'll, we'll let that one slide. And uh, <laughs> well, otherwise a phenomenal We can comment book. on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Colin. Mark. Okay. Yeah. So let's just address the outbound thing first. <laughs> um, a lot of you probably don't know this, but um, I, there is actually the first case written at Harvard Business School on HubSpot. Um, one of the main um, issues of discussion uh, is that I'm, I'm kind of, uh, you know, banging my fist on the door, on the, on the table saying, we need to cold call, guys. <laughs> we need to do outbound. And Brian and Darmesh are like, how could we do this? Like, we, we've been the inbound company. And so the, the reason I did it was because I've never been an advocate that you only do inbound, even when I was at HubSpot. And I, I got like 20% of my revenue through outbound. I was just advocating that at the time, we weren't leaning into it as much as we, um, you know, probably should have given the potential. So we'll just, we'll kind of leave that, leave that there and get into the speech. Does that make sense, Colin? Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. I, I had a, <laughs> when I was reading it, I had a good laugh and I was like, I wonder if the marketing team at HubSpot like stapled this in after you'd written it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. Thanks. Bob. Okay. So um, to the audience here, thanks for coming in. Um, please post your questions in the chat. I've got it up here. Um, uh, and and I'm gonna break. I'm not gonna wait till the end for questions. I'm gonna break a couple times as you see content, and hopefully take a couple, and then we'll keep cruising. I think we got 45 minutes together here, but you know, this has just been a subject. Yeah, I, you know, I've been working a lot of companies. We we've got a number of portfolio companies. I've I've got another couple, bunch of friends in other companies, and obviously the last two months have been crazy. And this is a question that starts coming up: is should we start scaling again? You know, like we've spent. We spent the last two months like trying to figure this out, like sometimes downsizing, getting the budget right. Some people are starting to see some predictability. And this question of like when to like reestablish scale has always been, you know, something I've been really studying the last couple of years. And, and if, you want, if you have a comment, you want to d direct it to me and try to answer this question, like when, when do you think you should start scaling? How do you answer that? I'd love to hear your, your comments. Um, but, um, you know, I, I would say, excuse, overused, what does this really mean? Yeah, the phrase at scale. Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, John Treek's kind of saying, McTie, John McTie's kind of saying at scale is overused, what does it really mean? You know, you know, I think what we're talking about here is like, we've got a sales team that produces a certain amount of revenue. When should we start adding to that if we're like a B2B context? Um, you know, I would say like, what a lot of people talk about is they talk about product market fit. You know, usually when I say, hey, when's the time to scale? Um, yeah, when you have product market fit. So I'd, I'd love if you want to chat to me directly or to everyone, what do you, what's your definition of product market fit? Um, that's perplexing. You know, Eric Reese introduced it in the Lean Startup, I think. I think that was the first time. And it was great. It really changed how we did entrepreneurship. You know, we, we actually used to build, we used to sell products before we built them, vaporware. It's just a bad way <laughs> to do it. And Eric like really framed this sort of agile development process with MVPs, minimal viable products, developing with the customer, you know, and it just really changed that zero to one moment. And then this supposed product market fit, which great, like let's scale, we have product market fit. But what does it mean? And, uh, you know, I, I think some really smart people say it's, it's when you have a, a workable product in a big market. It's fine, but like, really? I'm going to like base this critical decision on when to start hiring salespeople um, on like when I have a workable product in a, in a big market. A um, lot of people put, it says when you start generating revenue. It's measurable, but I have a big problem with that, honestly. 
Like, I just feel like if I can sell something, it doesn't actually mean I have product market fit. I think that's message market fit. Like whatever I told you, you bought, great. Did it work? Doesn't tell me anything on that, right? And so, you know, what I really lean into is if I had to pick one metric to, to really go under here, it would be retention. In my opinion, of all the metrics I could look at, um, customer retention would be um, my best, you know, measurement. And we we have some ways. I think most of the folks on the phone here, um, you know, here's how we think about measuring retention and what we think is really good retention. You know, the industry usually talks about if you have greater than ninety percent logos retaining every year, or over hundred percent revenue retention, which means your your upselling is offsetting your churn that is world-class retention. And I would say if you have that, I would say you have product market fit. Now, the problem is, you know, we're sitting here and we're like, we're acquiring customers in April, we're acquiring customers in May, should we scale again? I sort of buy this concept that if uh, retention, if people retain or they pay more, if it's not a subscription business, if they buy more from me, then yeah, that's product market fit. But it's gonna take like a year <laughs> for me to know whether that's happening in this new economy, right? It's like, and I can't wait a year to make this decision. So I buy the assumption, but I, I can't wait till friggin' January to figure out if, if we're attaining these customers and then start scaling. So we need to pursue a leading indicator to customer attention. Customer attention, yes, important, probably is a great metric to base product market fit on, but a lagging indicator. What is our leading indicator? What can we see in the first 30 to 60 days of a customer's experience with us that if this happens, they will likely be with us forever? And if it doesn't, they're probably going to leave. And I don't, I don't like, I haven't said a lot so far that hasn't been discussed except for this. Like, I rarely meet an entrepreneur and I'm like, what's your, cust your leading indicator to customer attention? rarely have thought about it right i mean we, we've seen like these uh the notion of an aha moment that's fine if you want to call it aha moment cool but what's your aha moment and so that's really what i've been looking as i think there's a big opportunity here that as entrepreneurs as cro's um we need to figure out our lead indicator customer attention and rally the entire organization around that to figure out when we have product market fit so we know when to reestablish scale Now's a great time to do it if you haven't done it because a lot of the historic data is sort of out the window right now. You know, like the close rate that you experienced in Q1 and Q4 of last year, it's pretty much irrelevant in most businesses. Uh, we just have to relearn that. So if you're going to relearn and reestablish, you might as well build a, a tighter foundation if some of this work inspires you. So I've been thinking like, what's a good definition of customer attention, the leading indicator? And I boil it down for the for the product founders, you'll like this. Uh, it's P percent of customers achieve E events in T days. Okay, so uh, let's just bring that to life for a second. So let's talk about Slack, okay? Slack, you know, this is pretty close to, I think what theirs was like 70% of customers send 2,000 team messages in the first 30 days. Beautiful. That's product market fit for Slack. If they sign up, whatever, 50 customers in a month in the early days, and 70% of them sent 2,000 team messages in the first 30 days. Yeah, I buy it. In 30 days, you knew if you had product market fit. And if you don't, it's pretty clear what we need to do. What sales needs to do in terms of expectations, what, what product needs to do in terms of development, what customer success needs to do in terms of where they get their customers. Wonderful. Okay, Dropbox, um, you know, a little faster. 85% of customers upload one file in one folder on one device within an hour. Right, HubSpot, I happen to know. Um, you know, 70% uh, of customer, 80% of customers, sorry, I'm like moving around all these Zoom windows so I can see what you guys are saying. 80% of customers use five features out of 25 features in the first 60 days, okay? So now we're getting somewhere. Now I think we've got a much more scientific, rigorous, data-driven approach to understanding product market fit as early as possible, okay? Now comments on the P, the E, and the T variable. P, I don't think it matters that much. I mean, I see ranges from 60 to 80%, but I'll show you later why I don't think it matters that much. E, that's the critical one. What is the event? And you'll see here that all of these events are factual. 
they're not like the customer success manager says they're in good shape. <laughs> That's bad. Um, they're instrumentable, meaning I can programmatically measure these things because I'm going to show you and suggest to you that as you're scaling, you're going to want to automatically see this on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So if it's instrumental, that'd be good. Um, and ideally, aligned with your unique value prop because you're going to align your entire organization around this. And if you can somehow choose your E event, this, that's the observable event and behavior you see in your, in your customer with where you're uniquely differentiated. Strate that's a strategically powerful combination. Okay, so HubSpot was a good example of that. As many of you probably know, we were the all-in-one player within a point solution competitive landscape. If all you needed was analytics, just go get Google Analytics. If all you needed was a blog, go get WordPress. If all you needed was a social media platform, go get Hootsuite. We're not going to be competitive on a one-off basis. But if you need your social media to talk to your blog, to talk to your email, to talk to your reps, to talk to your analytics, to et cetera, all in one, then use us. And so the fact that our e-event was five features out of 25 was beautifully aligned with our unique value problem. Okay. And so the last thing is to see this as early as possible. Um, this is how I like to organize it. And this is sort of the first deck that I, the first slide that I like to see in the board deck right now when we're trying to reestablish product market fit and reestablish our positioning in this marketplace to know if we want to scale. And so what this is, is just a cohort analysis organized by when the customers were acquired. Okay. So, um, this company, let's go back to our Slack example, okay? They're trying to get every company to send 2,000 team messages in the first 30 days. So they start out, they acquire 24 customers in January, and do, they don't do too good. 3%, <laughs> this isn't Slack's data, I'm just making an example. 3% of them hit that early indicator, that's not too good. 33% after three months hit it, still not good. After six months, only 39%, you can't tell me that a company that's in team communication and only 39% of their customers are sending, are, are, are sending 2,000 team messages, that's bad, okay? So at least we've measured it. But they made a bunch of changes, right? So they, um, uh, they, they like, you know, buy, you know, whatever. They, they, they align the product team, they improve their onboarding, improve their selling. Very rarely do we look at sales to fix this. Sales has the biggest thing to do with fixing this in terms of the customers they sell to and the expectations that they set on how this product works and what they should be doing to be successful. And look, by September, bam, they signed up 50 customers, not so good in the first 30 days, but crushed it 60 days later, two months later. 68% had got there and by three months, 75%. So that's why I'm like, I don't get caught up too much on the P percentage and the T days, the time, because I can just see that this is getting better. I would probably call product market fit sometime in the August, September timeframe. Look at how good this is. And so we'll just keep watching it, obviously. But, you know, I feel pretty good about that. And then statistically, I can prove that my leading indicator selection was correct over time. Because, like, hopefully within the first, like, 90 days, we see this. Um, and um, uh, and it's, it's um, you know, it's improving. And then we move on to the next step, which I'll talk to you about. But like we certainly we still want to instrument this. And a year later, we can check if our leading indicator selection actually statistically correlates. Okay, so this company acquired 68 company, comp, customers between 12 and 18 months ago. Okay, so we're sitting in Q2 right now. So these customers required in like Q2 and Q1 of 2019. Okay, they acquired 68 of them. Now, 55 out of those 68 had achieved the leading indicator. If we go back to our Slack example, 55 out of the 68 had sent 2,000 team messages in the first 30 days of their anniversary with the company, and 13 did not. And if we look at those companies, 93% of them that hit the leading indicator are still around. And only 39% of the one that didn't are still around. Bam, you nailed it. That's a beautiful lead indicator. It's predicting retention. Now, the bottom example would be an example of where you didn't get it. <laughs> you know, like, yes, yeah, still 68 customers required, 55 were in the good bucket, 13 were in the bad, but the retention rates between the two buckets were pretty similar. So you didn't get it. Now, you're sitting here a year later. Now you can actually do an analysis and hopefully you have captured a bunch of product usage data and see what actually is correlating and predicting. 
But guess what? You didn't waste the last year. Okay. Even though it didn't predict retention, having worked and aligned the organization on using your product more didn't hurt you. Okay. It's just that as we grow up even further, we do want to understand what actually is correlating, what actually is the difference between the people that keep stay with us forever and those that churn. So we can build that in the business. So there you go for the product founders online that want to think about it. This is how this is how I think about product market fit. I think the best measure of product market fit is not sales. It's not surveying your customers. That's dangerous, very false positive. It's not like subjectively having a good product in a big market. It's retention. But we don't have time to wait for retention. So it's about understanding the leading indicator to customer retention. And that's, that's what, how I think about product market fit. All right. So um, I'd love to stop there. If I see there's a Q&A thing popping up. Um, I don't know, Simon or Sarah, if there was a question there. Yeah, we've, we've got a couple here. Um, so, and then, um, so Jeff is asking, uh, you described HubSpot as an all-in-one solution that couldn't compete with point solutions one-on-one. How did you speak to message that trade-off uh, and the benefits and the different tools working together behind a single login? Yeah. Um, how did you message that? You know, honestly, like the way you'd sell into it is um, uh, you really have to do your discovery around the use cases that are valued by the all-in-one feature. Okay. So that, you know, John McMahon is amazing at this stuff. He was my mentor. He, he not as well known in the digital community, but like very well known in the venture community. He's on the board of MongoDB and Snowflake and uh, some great companies. He took PTC from a hundred million to a billion. And he's so good at like, he'd always walk around like, what's our unique differentiation? Making sure everyone understands it. And then making sure the discovery questions are aligned with it. Okay. So, so when people would walk into the HubSpot funnel and say, I just need a social media tool, you know, their mind is probably like, just go, why not just download Hootsuite for free if that's all I need? But what are we really trying to achieve? Like, can we just back up a second and, and tell me, like, why are you doubling down on social media? Oh, because we need to generate more leads. Okay, so how does increase in social media increase in your leads? Well, you know, clearly we'll be more visible out there and, you know, it, bringing people into our community will likely convert them and move them into the sales team. And like, okay, so you're thinking about some of these social media tools, like, how are you going to measure how that activity turns into a lead and a customer. And then is that connected at all to what you're blogging about? And you know what I mean? So it's just like through the discovery, you're helping them to see, even though their mindset was around just like, I need a tool to monitor social media and post stuff. Really at the end of the day, they wanted something to generate leads and they weren't connecting the values of these solutions being tied together in achieving that. So it really is like, how you, how you navigate the discovery to try to reframe them around your value. Is there anything else out there, Simon? You guys aren't up on video, right? Because I can't see. Is it just me? Yeah, yeah I've killed my okay, video. Cool. So people okay, are just looking you. at you. Okay. Um, so let me see here. Uh, Steven's asking, what are you using as signals around uh, the example to get the sales, sorry, uh, around, say, March in that example to get the sales to fix this problem by August? Yeah. Let me hold off on that one, dude, because um, okay. I'm going to, what we're going to, what we're getting at here is I'm going to play out the framework and then, um, and then we're going to talk about now that we've got a data-driven rigorous framework to know where we are on the rescaling or scaling up model, um, we can align our go-to-market decisions around it. But just to give you a teaser, like the seller that we're going to use here <laughs> is different than the scale-up seller. Right? And this goes all the way back to the sales learning curve work from like 20 years ago. You know, the seller that we're going to use here is more like a, a half product manager, half account executive, right? They, they actually wouldn't be a seller that if I threw them in a reasonably sized team, they wouldn't be my top rep. They, they might not even make quota, to be honest with you. But they, what they do is they can go out and have a bunch of co customer conversations, very discovery led. Very much like how you'd see a great product manager talk to customers. Why are you thinking about that? What do you, have you tried this? What about this? You know, and they can sense make, pattern recognize, and communicate to engineers. That's critical here. 
Okay. But unlike a pr- traditional product manager, they also have to be comfortable with the sales process, asking for money, handling objections, looking for power, et cetera. So these are tricky people to find. They're out there. You see them in a lot of startups and you see them in a lot of startups that have scaled up and they're like a lost wolf right now. They, <laughs> they don't know where to go. They don't want to be part of the factory. And they either come look for you as a new startup or they're helping startups open up new markets. But that's a teaser, but it goes beyond that. Do we have one more, Simon, that approve here? Yep. Uh, one more right now from Charlie. And he's asking, how many companies are using this method of developing leading indicators for customer retention and product market fit? Um, I know of like probably 50 um, in different forms, but it's still very early thinking. I mean, I really haven't even formally launched it. I talked a little bit about it at Saster last year. Um, I have an ebook on the Stage 2 Capital website. If you look at the very first blog article that we published behind that's something called The Science of Scaling. But I'm really just like talking this month on these webinars just so I can hear what your questions are and continue to refine the content. I'm going to go back to the ebook and then refine that. It's about 40 pages right now if you want to dig into it. Um, and a lot of images don't feel like it's like boring text re- re- reading. And then eventually I'll probably formally publish it. But for now, we're, we're iter- you know, I consider this an iteration with the with the industry. And if you have skepticism, please, please email me, LinkedIn me, or just ask a question today. Um, and we'll, we'll iterate on. Okay. Should we go forward? One, just one last question, because yeah, it's just kind of relevant. Owen is yeah. asking, he's in this role. Um, and I'm assuming as the, that sort of early that sales product person. manager, AA, sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, what would be your best advice to me? Um, I'm going to kind of get to that, but like, um, Make sure that the goals of the org are aligned with what I'm talking about and not revenue. That's probably one. We'd have to probably dig in Owen, a little bit on where you're at right now. But like, I guess it's that. Like, Don't try to get your management team not focus on revenue, but focus on the, the metric we just put up there. And then also um, do unscalable things. Okay, so that's what we're kind of get to right now is notice, and this is a perfect bridge if I move forward, notice that, I didn't mention anything about profits or unit economics or scale during this stage. And that's what you should be doing, Owen. So a lot of you may know David Cancel. He was our head of product at HubSpot, a good friend before then, now founder of Drift. When Drift was in this stage, he was flying to onboard customers that were paying him $50 a month. <laughs> the founder, all right? So it is hard. It is hard to dream up a product value prop build an MVP and get a meaningful percentage of your customers to use and realize that value. That's essentially what we're talking about. It is hard. So throw everything in the kitchen sink at it, Owen. Do not worry about scale. Okay. So that's where we move in. Once we have it, kudos to you. You have um, gotten beyond where most entrepreneurs get. And you've, you're, I'm actually very optimistic about your business now if you've tooled this in this way and you've got like really great re- leading the kids retention going, now we have to figure out what I call go-to-market fit. And that is actually doing what we just did, creating customer value consistently and scalably. All right. And so a lot of times we talk about scalab- scalability with, with regard to unit economics. Now we have the same problem as retention. Like we've talked about unit economics, like LTV to CAC, greater than three, payback period, less than 12 months, uh, a magic number greater than one. Okay, you can, you probably know these or you can Google them. They're very well uh, documented. It's going to take nine to 12 months to know if the activities we're doing today produce good unit economics, right? So we, again, have to find the lead indicators to that. Now, this is, um, I don't know if it's easier. It happens faster usually. And it really is algebra. And I'm going to go a little faster here. I'll give you guys these slides. Um, it's also in the ebook if you want to stare at it. But this is just like basic variables, right? It's like lifetime value, cost to acquire a customer, average contract value, what is our gross margin, and what's the sales qualified lead, okay? So here's our target. We want good unit economics, LTV to CAC. And I'm sorry if math isn't your thing because you're going to get a headache here, but I just want to throw, and there's an end conclusion that basically you don't need to know the math. You don't need to know the math. Um, uh, I just want to kind of prove it out to you. So all I'm doing is breaking each of these variables down. LTV, what is that? It's my how much my customers pay me times my profit margin, gross margin, divided by churn. 
Okay. What's CAC? Well, CAC is a sum of the, the cost to acquire to, to, from the marketing perspective to get the appointment and the cost to close the appointment, the sales. Okay. So what's the cost of marketing? Well, the cost of marketing for a customer is the cost per SQL divided by the SQL to customer ratio. Okay. And what's my cost to, uh, is, uh, to, to acquire a customer? It's my salesperson cost. I pay my, people, my salespeople $10,000 a month and divided by the number of customers that they actually close. So they close two customers. So $5,000 sales cost per customer. And I can extract that back even more because the, the cost the customers acquired per month is a function of how many SQLs they give each salesperson times the conversion rate. Okay, so I know it looks like headache but hopefully that is somewhat logical. And then this is, <laughs> this is what it ends up looking like. Um, and, and here's an example, right? So uh, of something that spits out pretty good. So uh, my business model says that I'm gonna, my average customer pays me 20,000 a year. I'm gonna have a 70% gross margin, 15% churn rate annually. My cost per SQL will be 1,000. My SQL, the customer rate, will be 5%. You can see the numbers, and that spits out a pretty good business. So good, I've, I've architected my leading indicators to unit economics, and now I can just dashboard it. Right? So all of you have CRM dashboards. I would just make sure you have these things here, where the red line is showing what I just drew up as my business model. Like how many SQLs per salesperson per month? What's my cost per SQL? These are all things that I can know now, like this week, right? And, and, and if I hit them, it's going to spit out a good business. And if I don't, I got to work on it. And I know by how much. Now, these red lines, there's no way it's going to be right. No way. No one ever gets it right. Your SQL per salesperson might be lower, but your cost per SQL might be lower too. And the business works out. But the point is we've instrumented it and we've, we're watching it, okay? So now what I have is, uh, the answer, in my opinion, on when to scale in a more rigorous data-driven way is when you have product market fit and go-to-market fit. And product market fit is when these green lights sh start showing up on your cohort analysis and scale and, and go-to-market fit is when the blue line stays along the, above the red line. Okay, so that I feel is a much more data-driven approach to that really critical answer. Because if we scale too fast, we're going to burn a lot of money, more money than we should have. That happens all the time. But it's like pretty much every startup I meet raises a Series A. They have two salespeople. They raise the Series A, and then they hire 10 salespeople the next month. That's crazy. That kills companies. Like how, how can you hire 10 salespeople in a month? We only have two. Do you know how many interviews that is? Where are you going to get these candidates? How are you going to feed them with demand? Who's going to manage them? Who's going to onboard them? That is crazy. Right? So at least we bring a little more rigor to, to this really critical decision. So now the, the, the question is like, how fast? So, so you can go back to your businesses and you can instrument the stuff if you like. The good thing for you guys is you're not like, you're probably not all seed funded businesses. You, you might be have some motion going. Unfortunately, that motion all broke two months ago and we got to piece it all back together. And I just would suggest that maybe you do it like this. Okay. All right. So now how fast should we go? Well, don't hire 10 reps in a month, right? It's a pace. Scale is a pace, not a lump sum hiring at the beginning of the year and then cross our fingers to hope that all the reps work. You don't just like go from two reps to 10 reps and have that much demand to feed them, right? So this becomes my speedometer, right? The, the lead indicator of customer retention, lead indicator of unit economics becomes my speedometer. And I'm going to say, okay, let's start hiring one rep a month. And let's do that for four months. And then let's watch the speedometer. Because scale can compromise the speedometer. If I don't train my reps right, if I don't hire the right reps, but I'll know really early, six months earlier than the P&L. Because that's what we normally do. We sit in the board and we're like, should we go faster? Well, let's look at the P&L. How's the revenue growth? How's the profit? Dude, the P&L is a function of decisions and execution we did nine months ago. It's irrelevant. This is the speedometer. This is how the business is doing right now. So let's hire one rep a month for four months. If the speedometer looks good, let's go to two months. 
for four months. If it still looks good, let's go to four a month. Now we're cooking eight a month. Now we're building a unicorn in a healthy way. Okay. All right. So um, let me just stop there. Did any questions come up there, Simon? You might be on mute. Yeah, I just got a, I've got a double mute going on here. Good for you. <laughs> so we've got uh, any opinion on the validity of sales velocity as the leading indicator? Sales velocity. I guess they're probably thinking about like revenue. Oh, okay. So, so, so sales cycle. Um, hmm. Yeah, you know, I got to think about that one. It's a good question because it's not really built into where I put that in is the unit economics. Okay, so obviously, if we're talking about sales velocity, is how long does it take from a lead being generated, a meeting being generated, to when they become a customer? Obviously, one week is amazing, and one year is tough to swallow. And that you you have that typically in big enterprise deals. Um, so clearly, there's going to be a correlation between the sales velocity and the CAC typically. Okay, so that's. That's probably where it's built in, um, but I have to think about that a little bit. You know, and, and I, I've run this with companies with like literally four-day sales cycles, and I've run it with companies with six-month sales cycles, um, and it still checks out, but it's, it's a good question. So I would say measure sales cycle, measure sales velocity. It's going to be strongly correlated to CAC and cost of customer acquisition, and, and that's going to be strongly correlated to unit economics and your ability to achieve them. Okay. Well, I'll think a little bit more on that. Anything else, Simon? Yeah, just just thinking on um, the the go to market fit and, and scalable unit, unit economics. Somebody's asking if you could expand on your definition of go to market fit. Yeah, so go to market fit is simply so product market fit is um, consistently retaining customers, and we measure it through leading indicators. Go to market fit is consistently retaining customers. Scalably. Okay, so remember David Cancel in the, in the product market fit stage, he's flying to all his customers even though they're paying him $50 a month. Perfect behavior for product market fit. Throw everything in the kitchen sink to get that to 70% to get retention really high. Not good behavior for go-to-market fit. We have to, we have to codify this thing before we scale. Cool? Gotcha. Okay. Um, we've got uh, Hashim has mentioned that as a sales manager, so it sounds like he's a sales manager. How do you do this if you have pressure from above to scale as fast as possible? Yeah, great question. I spent a lot of team in board meetings and management teams um, with this. I'm hope I'm seeing through some of the work and evangelizing that like the board members are on paid, like they kind of start adopting this as a plan. Like they they get away from like the the ten reps a month. Out of, out of the gate. Um, so number one, when you're raising money, like maybe have a, you know, when you raise money, um, diligence uh, your investors around their approach. When you're a sales manager joining a company, diligence your bosses around their perceptions of scale. Um, geez, I mean, I, I basically run the math usually. Like I basically run a model where it's like, I can hire 10 reps today. Um, and not any for the rest of the year, and that spits out a number, but you really have to factor in attrition, and let's have a realistic attrition when we do that. Like, uh, I think you're gonna have 70% attrition personally, but if you wanna say 40% attrition on those 10 reps, run that through and run it for like two years um, versus running one rep a month and then two reps a month and then four reps a month with maybe like 15% attrition, which I think is very doable. And where do you end up with two years from now? Much healthier business. Okay, so, so that might be a way to do it, but it's tricky. Maybe you can send them the ebook. We'll, we'll get the link for you here. Um, but that might be a way to do it. Awesome. Should we keep I'll, going, Simon? Or one more? Yeah, I'll, I'll track that down. We got one last one uh, from sure. Daniel. And uh, if your ARR retention is much better than your logo retention, what does that say about your product market fit? Um. In a small business community, it's not bad. You kind of want to look, you, want, you kind of want both to be exceptional, obviously. Um, it's still pretty good and pretty impressive, especially if you're early to have uh, like 110 revenue retention and maybe it's like a 70% logo retention. From a pure spreadsheet business model, it's going to be great because essentially what it means is you're going to keep growing even though you don't add customers. 
because your customer base grows on its own. And that's a wonderful flywheel to effect. The negative aspect to it is 30% of the market is running around town saying we tried that product and didn't work for us. Right. So that's where the concern comes. So you still like, um, it just depends. Like I'd, I, I could make a case that you're still in product market phase and you should clean that up. I can make a case that if you look at that and see a lot of low hanging fruit, you can move forward with the scale stuff and execute the low hanging fruit and see if it pops up. But it's going to be hard to be a really successful business with a sub bar logo retention of 70% um, and a really strong 110%. The only exception is in a real small business community where the reasons why that logo retention is high is not because of you. It's because like these businesses just go out of business, et cetera. We have a, a portfolio company and the, the sales to come uh, residential real estate and their numbers look a little bit like that. And it's just, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just the, it's just the reality. And people are not running around town saying the product sucked. People are joining other firms and bringing it with them. Okay. So, so it's a little bit different, depends on your context. Cool. Sounds great. You have okay. to keep going. Okay. Do we have to stop at two fifteen? No, or like you, I'm you in Eastern go. time. Yeah. You can go a little bit beyond. We've okay, got, cool. uh, look, yeah, we've got until the, our next talk is at 1130 and we need about okay. uh, five, 10 minutes to prepare for okay. that. So, so let, me, let, me, let me cruise through and then we'll take one or two more questions and you guys can get to your next one. Beautiful. All right. So the other thing in this where to scale, especially for folks who are of scale, you're not seed funded, you're, you're a $10 million business, you're a $20 million business, you're a $100 million business, and you're trying to reestablish whether you can scale. The danger there is averages in your business are super dangerous. You're like looking at it like, oh yeah, things look good. Um, my payback period is 11 months. Um, you know, my churn is low. You know, it's, it's 10%. Um, you know, it looks really good, but we have to look under the hood to see how the different um, segments in our business are performing. Okay, so... Um, so basically what this company, this company is roughly what, a $30 million business. They, it, and you segment by three dimensions, product, market, and channel, okay? Anytime you change one of those, usually you have to relearn it, okay? So this company is selling to two markets, mid-market enterprise. They have two products. One's brand new, so it has no ARR. And they sell through two channels, a direct sales team and a partnership team. And you can see here that the direct sales team for the current product for both markets is quite good. Good LTV to CAC, good churn. They have not figured out their partner channel. And if you didn't segment this out, you wouldn't know it. It's complicated. There's, we could do a whole session on cost attribution to figure this out, but like make an attempt. It's not gonna be perfect, make an attempt. And so now what you're in a position to do is strategically identify your scale versus experiment versus ignore segments. And so most importantly, you wanna be able to, you wanna be able to, um, uh, separate these. So lots of times, like you see that new product they had coming in here. So many times people are like, oh yeah, we just built this new product. Let's train the whole sales team on it. Like two months before it's ready and, and get in big, do a big conference on it and announce it and then go. And it's like, <laughs> well, when you had the idea, when you got your seed funded, half a million dollars, like, what did you do? Did you like, take your business plan and then hire a couple of engineers to build it and then hire 10 reps and train them on it? No, you like kept it small and cross-functional and you learned and you iterated and what it ended up being is different than what you thought. Like, but why when we become $20 million and buy and build a new product, do we not repeat that? Why do we train the whole sales team on a product that hasn't even been used by a customer yet? It just kills productivity. So differentiate your scale buckets from your learning buckets, your experimenting buckets, and keep these small cross-functional teams. And this looks a lot like the rep in the product market fit stage because that's where they're at. This AE is way different than this AE. Okay, so just think about that as you're reestablishing scale. So now get into, uh, was it Owen's question, I think, or Owen was one of them, someone else had the question. Well, how do we, um, how do we uh, align our go-to-market with each one of these, okay? So, so, okay, product market fit stage. We're trying to get consistent customer attention. We're working on our early indicator of customer attention. So if like HubSpot using five or more features, okay? So we want to target an early adopter. 
win at all costs, go to market. That's what David Cancel was doing. Founders are flying, sitting with $50 a month product companies. Um, we hire a particular type of rep, a proc major plus A. We talked about this. And these three right here, demand gen, pricing, compensation, don't matter. All right? We're talking about how to comp our reps right now. We're focused on the wrong stuff. All right. So like, if anything, comp the rep, not on the signature, comp them on when the early indicator, the lead indicator of retention happened. It's beautiful. Like, you know, it's like 30 days in, it's like, did they hit 2000 team messages? That's when they get paid. Okay. Pricing, like we can be a little creative there. It's like just price for commitment. It's like at full price, this is $50,000 a year, but we only have 10 customers. I'm just trying to get to 20. All right. I'm just, I'm giving this in a way for 60% discounts for the first year, just to like, we're, we're trying to figure this out. Okay. And so that gives me the at-bats that I need. Okay. Now, when we move to go to market fit, now scale matters. I need a codified playbook. I can't fly to onboard $50 a month, you know, customers. I can't like rely on my referrals. I need a scalable demand gen channel. I need, I don't have my coin operator yet, rep yet. I got like four process builders, four people who, who like the fact that they know how to build a playbook and they like the fact that they're iterating the playbook every day, getting it ready for scale. Right. And my, 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 my price and my comp plan matters a lot. Like that, that is what drives you in economics is, is this price. and comp. So I got to work on those. And the comp plan I like here is 50% on the signature, 50% on the lead indicator of customer retention. That's what I like. Keep the focus on retention. Don't let them fake this way through. Okay. And then finally we get into the scale model, right? So, um, you know, now, oh geez, I just, the chat's all blowing up on me. Um, so now it's like, I got my different segments like we laid out. My, my goals is revenue growth now. I'm, ha- I'm adding reps. I got my scale segments and my experiment segments, and I got my ignore segments. I've got my playbook, and I have a management layer to reinforce it, to listen to calls, to look at the, the CRM data, and make sure we're following the process. I got the coin-operated rep. Give me the playbook. Give me the comp plan. Let me go make a lot of money and make you a lot of money and, and bring out a lot of great customers. I'm aligning sales and marketing, and I have a scalable pricing model and a compensation structure that rewards promotion. Okay. So that's it. That's, that's the framework. When do you scale when you have product market fit and go to market fit much more data driven, hopefully rigorous definition on those two. And when we scale, it's about a pace, not about a lump sum hiring. And hopefully this gives you some insight, like knowing where you, not just where you are, but how you make frontline go-to-market decisions to accelerate yourself through each phase. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not advocating slower growth. I'm advocating healthier growth. And I think when you model things out realistically, one year out, two years out, you get to a much faster growth rate more predictably. What do you got for, for questions, Simon? We've got lots of positivity uh, coming here. Um, just while I'm going to give everybody a minute to drop some more questions in the Q&A here because uh, Sebastian's been answering them um, as they come along. Um, there's been some just tactical stuff. There was a really interesting thing that I've heard you talk about, and I, I believe it was either in your book or in some of the blog posts where you were talking about compensation for sales reps and you had an interesting experience when you were at HubSpot yeah. and, uh, and how you've changed their comp plan to optimize for customer success. Yeah, there were two of them. One was for the marketing product in the first days of HubSpot. And then when we moved to the CRM, there was an interesting observation there. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we comp, it was pretty standard. It was like, it was based on like, you know, uh, total ARR in a month that you bring on and uh, with an accelerator. So double the comp if they're north of the quota. Beautiful hunting plan. Beautiful hunting plan. Went from like a hundred to a thousand reps, a uh, hundred to a thousand customers in literally like seven months. But churn was ridiculous. Eight <laughs> percent a month, Simon. Do the math on that. You're losing eight percent of your customers a month. <laughs> How many customers do you have at the end of the year? Zero. <laughs> it's not a businessman. And it was funny because when we we looked at the retention by customer success manager, it was all the same. When we looked at the retention by salesperson and the customers they brought on, that's where the variation was. So we realized, holy cow, our churn problem has nothing to do with our product and has nothing to do with our onboarding process for customers. 
It has to do with how we're selling. And so we just aligned the comp with the, the retention. Now, we did it in a way that I wouldn't recommend. It worked, but it's a little complicated. You can see in the book, and I've written about it. Um, it was around like a correlation to their LTV to CAC ratio, honestly, their, their lifetime value. But I would do it today, like I said, 50% on the signature and 50% when the lead indicator happens. So if your lead indicator is someone sets up the product, they get half their payment when they sign the contract and half the payment when the, when the customer signs up their, their product. Now, you got to communicate to the rep, I'm not trying to turn you into a CSM. I'm not trying to make you responsible for onboarding. We have a team for that. I just want you to pay attention. I want you to check in with the CSM to see how it's going. I want the CSM, I want you to get back involved if it goes sideways because you had the relationship. And when it doesn't work, I want you to reflect on the expectations you set in the sales process that caused the failure of setup and, and reflect on when it went well, what did you say? Okay, so that's number one. Number two was on the, um, when we learned out, when we rolled out the, the, the CRM, it was our first attempt at freemium. And we had a couple of sales reps in there, but, but like sales reps can really like hurt product-led growth and freemium because they can call on your, cost, your free downloads and try to close business. And it, it ruins the ability for, um, for the, that person to kind of naturally, humanistically adopt so we, uh, we went into this adopt before buy mentality. Like the reps were first get them to adopt and then get them to buy. And so the way I codified that in the, in the comp plan is I said, you know, you, know, you know, Simon, that most comp plans, they reward you more for the first sale and less for the follow-on sale. You know, it's like, that's how it's get your foot in the door. That's the hard part. That's where we pay our reps. And for expansion, that's easier. So we pay them less. That is at odds with product-led growth. That is at odds with freemium and how we want our customers to adopt. So I spun that on its head and I told the reps, hey folks, um, I'm gonna pay you 20% more for expansion revenue than first revenue. And they were snickering. They're like, Robert, you're such an idiot, man. Like, do you know what I'm gonna do? When I have an account on the line that has 100 seats, <laughs> I'm gonna close two seats right now and wait two months and close the other 98 seats. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> because <laughs> dude, that is awesome. That's exactly what we want. That's product led growth. Like by only closing the two seats now, you're gonna keep it super simple and the budget low. You're gonna get that deal in like two days as opposed to trying to close all 100 at once. And it takes like three months. And guess what? They're not gonna expand to the 100 seats if the first two don't go well. So if it fails, I don't care. It's two seats. That's it. But if it expands, our, neg our revenue retention is off the charts. So there's a couple examples, Simon, on the comp plan. Fantastic. We got a couple last questions here. Uh, we got probably about four more minutes here. So we got uh, two more. We have one we'll from quick. Vic um, asking for guidance in terms of monthly recurring or annual recurring revenue as applicable to these three stages. Doesn't matter. Semantics. Semantics. You know, it really doesn't matter on the math. Like, is whether you're tracking MRR or ARR. Um, but you know, this is built in, you saw in the math on the unit economics, you saw where I built it in. The, the ACV is, the, is essentially the ARR per customer. Um, but it really doesn't matter if you give your reps quotas of you know, 5,000 MRR per month or 600,000 ARR per year, which is 60,000 ARR per month. It's just, it's just semantics. Gotcha. What's the last one? Similar question, just all in terms of timeframes. Is there any ideal time frame to move from stage one to stage two, stage three? Um, you know, for a company with a sales cycle of two to three months, and then I'll mm -hmm. add the follow-on question. You know, at what point do you start to get worried when you see a company that's sort of stuck in one particular stage? Yeah, the answer is as fast as possible. <laughs> all right, but but of course, like you know, if you're if you're like a workday type company selling to big companies. Um, there's a little bit of an adjustment. I have to expand the ebook a bit to modify that. Um, but you know, you could get through product market fit with like four customers. You know, I mean, these are big multi-million dollar potential deals, and you're looking at like more complex health charts. When I when I'm working with a company that's an enterprise deal company, like a workday, in the early stages, we're not looking at that cohort chart with like 20 reps per month. 
we're looking at each customer <laughs> and we're looking at their health card. Okay. Um, so it, a lot of it depends on you're selling pencils or you're selling jets. Right. Um, but I would say on average, if we're talking about a customer, a company that's selling like say 40 or 50,000 ARR uh, uh, tickets um, with say uh, uh, a four to six week sales cycle, um, then I would say if you're doing well, you get through product market fit phase from beginning to end in say two quarters and you can get through go to market phase in like say four months or so. All right. And I often ask like, what's our approximate revenue line that I see these days. I see product market fit. You're, you're starting to approach like half a million to a million go to market fit. You're like 750,000 to 1.5 million. And then you're kind of going to the scale mode. And I do predict that if we start adopting this stuff, we may see that happen a lot faster. Perfect. That's everything we have. Mark, thank you so much for, for joining us today and staying a little bit longer um, and answering a ton of questions as you went. That was phenomenal and super valuable. We had tons of great feedback in the, uh, in the chat. I don't know if you had a chance to see all that, but people yeah, were I did. very excited. Thank you. Thank you. And I saw you drop the link in there. Uh, shoot, in the deck, if you can get it out to people, I yep. did have some resources at the end um, that in one of them was the download for, for that document. Um, so, so that's theirs for, for you. Perfect. We will include that in the, in the Slack chat. If, if anybody's interested, um, Sebastian can also track it down in the chat now so we can throw that link there and then um, it's going to, it'll live forever in the forever in the Slack chat. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to see that uh, you can check it out there. Perfect. Perfect.